Uh, glad to be here with you for this midweek Lenten service where we will... Okay. Wait, I was supposed to s not start right now? Well, if it is live streaming, then we already made our first mistake, so... Now I will officially say good afternoon. Oh boy, that's embarrassing. Um, once again, I'm Pastor Riki from Palis. Glad to be here with you today. Uh, for our midweek Lenten series of the three words of truth, we're going to fast forward all the way to the end of Jesus' passion uh, as the angry mob uh, shouts to Pontius Pilate to take him away. So that will be the focus of our message this afternoon. The order of worship is printed for you in the worship folder. Let us begin our service by singing the opening hymn, hymn 105, the first five stanzas.
stand as we worship the Lord our God. O Lord, open my lips. us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name. Forgive our sins. Speak to our hearts. Dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word and receive our hymns of thanks and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. be acceptable in your sight. Come and help us in time of need, that we may sing your praise in holy joy, now and forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. may be seated. I invite you to join me in the Passion reading as your title is brought up. The detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials bound Jesus and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus replied, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus had said this, one of the officials nearby Is this the way you answer the high priest? If I said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple, and in three days will build another, not made by man. Yet their testimony did not agree. And then the high priest stood up before them. 
Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, and coming on clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes, and he asked, Why do we need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him and said, You also were that man to me, Jesus. But he denied it and said, I don't know or understand what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. He went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this is one of them. Again he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them. I don't know this man God. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. When Judas, who betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty silver coins to the chief priests and elders. He said, I have sinned. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. This is our passion reading. We continue with our next hymn.
him who died so that we might live, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Words of consideration for our message this afternoon come from John chapter 19. Find them printed in your worship folder. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. This is the word of our God. On July 9th, 2006, the World Cup final happened in Berlin, Germany. And for you soccer aficionados out there, you can probably remember which two teams were playing. It was France and Italy. The match was a tight one with a goal scored early by each team, but that was it. And so at the end of the 90 minutes of regulation, it was still tied one to one, and they needed extra time to determine a winner. Then, about 20 minutes into extra time, it happened, where French midfielder Zinedine Zidane turned around and headbutted the Italian defender Marco Materazzi, arguably the most famous headbutt of all time. Now, you don't need to know anything about soccer to figure that's illegal. Everybody watching on TV was was shouting at their TVs, take him off, send him off. The Italian supporters in the stadium were shouting the same thing, send him off, give him a red card. And yes, indeed, the, the referee gave Zidane an immediate red card, sending him off for the remainder of the match. France would go on to lose that match in a penalty shootout only minutes later. But that's where the drama really got started. As people were trying to decipher what in the world would have caused Zidane to to lose his head in such a critical moment in the match. The best story that came out was that Materazzi had insulted Zidane's sister. So maybe we can get a little bit of empathy for what he did, even though we can't still excuse it. He was still sent off because of something that he did. This afternoon, we consider another case of another man being sent away, being sent off. But the difference in this case is this man did nothing wrong. Even the most ardent of French soccer fans would have to agree that Zidane did something worthy of being sent off, while this man, Jesus, did not. And instead, he was greeted with the the cries of, take him away, take him away, such a far cry from what he had heard only days earlier. Those shouts of, Hosanna, Hosanna. So here, on this third midweek Lenten service, We take a look at those words, take him away. And and in those words, we see the, the sheer hatred of the devil being poured out upon God's own son. But we also see something else. We also see God's love in those very words as Jesus was being taken away. He left those crowds to to their sinful cravings while he forwarded his father's plan of grace. But what did Jesus do to deserve what they were saying about him? What did Jesus do to earn this hatred towards him? Was it 
the, the healing that he did to any number of people? Was it making the lame walk, the blind see, raising a few dead people? Or more importantly, was it teaching the word of God in a correct way so that people understood what God was telling to them through the Old Testament prophets, what God's will was for their lives? None of this was worthy of any hatred. And so the words that, that Jesus spoke the night before to his disciple are absolutely accurate. They hated me without reason. Well, there still had to be some reason. At least that's what our human minds like to think, because there, there's any number of people in this world that, that feel they wouldn't just hate him for no reason, for no cause. There had to be something, because that stems from the idea that, that we are by nature naturally good, that it, we do maybe some bad things, but generally speaking, we, we do more good than bad, or maybe we're born into this world with a blank slate and it's only our environment that shape us into to doing good things or bad things. There was even a, a Harvard psychologist who, who wrote that at our very core, we all have a true self that is kind, compassionate, caring, curious, and calm. That's what we like to think. And yet we see none of that in this instance. We see none of the, the curiosity, none of the caring, none of the compassion in this crowd that was shouting for Jesus' death. Instead, we see Paul's words to be more true. Where the Apostle Paul writes, the sinful mind is hostile to God. And there was never a day filled with more hostility than when that crowd shouted, take him away, crucify him. And Jesus picked up his own cross and left the crowd behind to their sinful cravings. What were they craving? His blood. But why were they craving it? It wasn't for, for any of those other things that we had mentioned before, but really it was because Jesus was upsetting their way of life. He was upsetting the status quo that they had with their earthly superiors, the, the Roman Empire that reigned over Israel at that time. In fact, one of the, the members of their Sanhedrin had said this, that, that if we allow Jesus to keep going on like this, he's going to gather more and more people, and then the Romans are going to get concerned, and then they're going to take away our temple, and they're going to ruin our entire way of life. Does this sound like someone who is concerned about eternity? Or is this more someone who is concerned about their own life and station in life here on earth. And these are members of the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders who are supposed to be pointing people toward that eternal relationship with God, and yet they were the ones who were leading the chance of take him away, take him away, crucify him. And it would be around the Passover that they sh shared those words. Kind of an interesting irony in that. When they said that they had no king but Caesar, because it would be the same Caesar who some 30 years from now would, would come with his armies and destroy the temple. It would be the same Caesar who 100 years from now would once again come to, to put down a Jewish rebellion, this time raising the city of Jerusalem to the ground, rebuilding it as a Roman city, changing its name, and forbidding any Jews from entering into it. It's the same Caesar that, that the, the Jewish high priests were saying, this is the one that we serve. On the morrow of the Passover, a reminder of how God set them free from their captors in Egypt. Here they were pledging servitude. Oh, the power of the sinful nature on the hearts of men, both then and now. Oh, that, that strong desire that, that wells up within each and every one of us to make this earth our final home, to, to make it our heaven on earth, make it as good and a, as perfect as possible. And sometimes we do that without even realizing it, even for the best of us. 
can happen when you have a, a politically engaged Christian that, that gets so obsessed with politics that they say, if, if only the, this candidate gets elected, or if only this particular policy is enacted, then this world is going to be a better place. It takes place when we worry more about the money in our bank account or lack of money in our bank account than we do in trusting the God who has provided us with everything that he will continue providing for us. It happens when we, we're afraid of what people think when they find out that we're a Christian more so than we're afraid of what our God thinks when we hide our Christianity. It happens when we forsake short-term or long-term gain for short-term pleasures. And when we do each and every one of these things, we, we fall into the devil's trap. We fall into the devil's lie that this is really good for us. And we essentially are shouting along with the rest of the crowd on that Good Friday, take him away, take him away. We want nothing to do with him or what he says for our lives. What's the consequence for buying into this lie? Our short-term pleasure equals long-term pain. An eternal separation from God in hell. But then we begin to understand when Jesus says words like, take up your cross and follow me, deny yourself. We, we understand that it isn't for his benefit that he says those words, but rather for our own. For when we deny those sinful cravings, we deny that which is really harmful to us. When we turn our, our backs on them and we turn towards Jesus and say, we want to follow you because we recognize you are the way to eternal life. We repent of those times where we have fallen away, where we have succumbed to our own weakness, and yet even that does not save us. That only points us in the right direction because only Jesus saves. Thank God that is the case. Thank God that it does not one iota depend upon my devotion to God, my zeal for God, my desire to follow Christ. Because if it would, we'd always be left questioning. But rather, it is all entirely dependent upon Jesus' desire, Jesus' devotion, Jesus' zeal to follow the plan of his Father. And that is what he did that day. John records it for us almost nonchalantly without emotion that, that Jesus picked up his cross and he was led to Golgotha and there they crucified him. There's a kind of calm dignity about Jesus in the midst of, of all of this ugliness and an iron will resolve to, to go forward with the plan that his father had planned leaving behind the sinful crowd to their cravings and moving forward God's gracious plan. A plan that was foreshadowed in Israel's festival that they had just gotten done celebrating the Passover. A time when the Israelites could remember back to the first Passover when God was delivering his people from Egypt. He called for each family to take a lamb to slaughter that lamb and to paint its blood on the door frames of their houses, thus allowing the angel of death to pass over with his destructive plague. That blood literally saved thousands of baby boys that night. And that blood was pure grace. It wasn't that the Israelites were, were any less sinful than the Egyptians. But God had chosen them. God had made them his people. He had changed their lives and he had provided deliverance. And once again, he was providing deliverance on this day. As Jesus went to the cross, he was carrying forward his father's gracious plan. There once again was blood. Blood shed to deliver but not just the firstborn boys, but to deliver everyone. The holy blood of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, takes away your sin and mine, your guilt and mine, your shame and mine. 
But as far as the east is from the west, this far has He separated our sins from us, and He remembers them no more. His blood is our robe of righteousness. And those who trust in this truth have a glorious future that awaits. A glorious future that John talks about in the last book of the Bible. When he describes those who clothe themselves in the blood of the Lamb as these righteous saints who have come out of tribulation in a sin-cursed world. These in white robes, who are they? The elder asked. John answered, you know. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. This blood, this forgiveness, this robe of righteousness is what Jesus was carrying with Him to Golgotha that day. And then, on his first missionary journey some 15 years later, the Apostle Paul stopped at a synagogue in what is now modern-day Turkey, as was his custom to go first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And it was there that, that he kind of explained what was going on on this Good Friday. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus Yet, in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Paul would later write in the book of Romans that the rejection of Christ by the Jews meant reconciliation for the world. That is, a bringing back together between God and man, a removing of hostility. When we consider the words that those, that crowd shouted, take him away, take him away, we shudder to think. And aren't we glad that we weren't actually physically in that crowd participating? And yet, the crowd got its wish. When Jesus was led him away, or when Jesus was led away, the crowd never saw him again. For even after his resurrection, he only appeared to those who believed in him, not to those who did not. Such a stark judgment in and of itself. And so even in this this mass of ugliness, take him away, take him away, we can see God doing what he does best. Working out good. Accomplishing our salvation even through the worst of human actions. This is what Lent reminds us of and is all about. Amen. Now may he who began a good work in you carry it out to completion on the day of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This time we continue our service with the next hymn, hymn 117, The Selected Sanzas.
we collect our offerings to the Lord, I invite you to sign the friendship card and the, your pews as well. Please stand at this time for prayer. In the closing hours of this day, hear us as we pray, O Lord. For the well-being of people everywhere, for the growth of your church in all the world, and for the strengthening of all who serve and worship here, we pray, O that come with every stage of life and for joy in doing your will we pray O oh Lord Lord have mercy for our public servants who work day and night to bring protection justice, learning and health to this and every place we pray to you
thanksgiving for your many and varied gifts to us, we now commend ourselves to your care. Be our shield and strength, O Lord. desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us for also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.